So the other day I posted um, a video on YouTube which encouraged older adults to make sure they schedule and actually integrate into their week or training program um, rest and or recovery based exercise sessions. Now, this is, like I said um, in the part, the previous video is really, really um, often underestimated in terms of the importance and often overlooked. And what I want to do today is just take you through a couple of pieces of evidence that give some backing or foundation to this need for older adults to indeed rest and recover. Okay, well, let's have a look at the STEC study uh, published back in 2017. And the objective of this study was to look at how best to titrate the dose of resistance training and what dose would lead to maximizing regrowth of muscle tissue and also what would lead to the best gains in muscle function. So let's go through that. Just before we do that, however, I do need to be upfront with you guys. If you're looking for something fancy, videos, AI generated images, illustrations, you've come to the wrong place. I'm just giving you the raw data from the research. So if you want something fancy, you'll have to go someplace else. The key finding from the STEC trial was that three high load strength training sessions per week for the lower limbs induced pro-inflammatory alterations in gene expression. Now this suggested that for many older adults, such volume, i.e. three high intensity strength training sessions per week, may not be conducive to optimizing training adaptations. The cytokines related inflammatory responses that were investigated in this trial are very interesting. One, because a lot of research or most you could say uh, that explore responses of older adults and strength training or resistance training do not report on these sorts of changes. So let's go through them now. What these results demonstrated was the older adults that performed strength training three times per week with heavy loads, they experienced a pro-inflammatory response as represented by the cytokines related measures. Substantially higher cytokine related elevations were recorded in the older adults that did do strength training three times per week with heavy loads. Now, one could postulate that maybe you need some inflammation to get gains in strength and or function. But the thing was that the other group where they didn't do through strength training with heavy loads three times per week, they actually did it twice per week with heavy loads and replaced one of the heavy load sessions with a lighter, faster, power-related session they actually experienced greater strength gains and greater functional gains um, in that particular group. And it would be remiss of me to mention that not only was there greater strength and functional gains, that the skeletal lean body mass or muscle mass was best achieved in that group that did the two heavy sessions with the one lighter, faster strength training session per week. Let's now just take a quick look at some of the adaptations that were made in the groups and what differences existed. So you can see in this first graph, this looks at total body lean mass changes in grams over the duration of the study, which was 35 weeks. And you can see that that HLH group, the heavy light, heavy group, had the greatest total body lean mass changes versus the other groups. In terms of the changes in the thigh, i.e. quadriceps muscle mass changes in grams, once again, you can see that the HLH group had the greatest alterations in this muscle mass. So once again, showing superiority over the other groups for this indice. 
For changes in leg extension capacity to express strength during a leg extension movement. So this is looking at quadricep strength changes. Once again, you can see that the HLH group had the greatest changes in this particular parameter. And finally, and this one's the real kicker, if you look at the highlighted area of this table in orange, we're looking here at VO2 consumption at steady state during walking and also heart rate heart rate changes over the duration of the trial. Now, the only group that made significant improvements in these measures was the HLH group. So they showed better efficiency in terms of walking at steady state. So just walking along, there was less oxygen used to, to perform that activity, meaning they were more efficient. Additionally, their heart rate was lower at that particular level. So their, their cardiovascular efficiency and their fitness improved above and beyond the other groups. Summarising then, replacing one of those heavy load strength training sessions in the week with a lighter, faster, more power oriented session, that nullified this pro-inflammatory response and that resulted in greater benefit across the board in skeletal muscle, in muscular strength, and in function. Look, now, interestingly, the results that I've just canvassed, they relate specifically to the lower limbs. And what they found with the upper limbs was a little different. Now, they didn't explore in inflammation or inflammatory markers in the upper limbs, but they did find that the heavy load resistance training performed three times per week was the, was the most effective. So there could be differences between what the lower limbs require and what the upper limbs require in older adults. However, this is something I'll explore in another video. Here's a quick look at those changes in the upper limbs. So we're looking firstly at the arm muscle mass changes in grams. Uh, and you can see that that HHH group, so the three heavy load sessions per week, resulted in the greatest change in arm muscle mass over this 35-week period. In relation to the changes in arm curl strength, so i.e. a bicep curl, you can see once again that the group that performed the three heavy load sessions per week over that 35-week period uh, showed the greatest changes in strength versus the other group. So the arm muscle mass changes or total arm muscle mass changes over that period of time did correlate with these changes in arm curl strength. The second study that we'll go through today is the Osato and co-workers study from 2018 and this explored neuromuscular and functional recovery in older adults unaccustomed to strength training following just one session. As you can see by the following three graphs, neuromuscular and functional recovery in these older adults that were unaccustomed to this strength training session, a single strength training session, was quite impaired, meaning that when they tried to express strength or do things like a counter movement jump or stair climb or stair de descent going downstairs, all these things were impaired. Now, that's probably probably not the key take home because that would be expected. It's more the recovery after 72 hours where the data still showed that there were many participants that still had quite impaired neuromuscular function and also functional indices like stair climbing, etc. So I think the take home of this data is that in those that are starting strength training, older adults that are starting strength training and not accustomed to it, the recovery mechanisms are going to be quite impaired and you need to factor that in in terms of how long you rest before the next session. The implications of this research when you look at the data, when you look at that delay in terms of recovery of neuromuscular and functional capacities, is that you need to 
be very careful in terms of post-workout activities, like in that first 72 hours, because there is this impairment of function, of muscular function, of doing things like going upstairs, changing direction, etc. There could be, and this is this is speculative, but you're drawing a string from the data to the possible implications. Older adults should be cognizant that there could be an increased risk of falls in that post-workout period for those that are unaccustomed to strength training, so those commencing or starting strength training uh, and haven't done any, any of that previously. So yes, there's, there's this need for older adults to be aware that in that 72 hours after strength training, if they haven't done much of it in, in the past, that things like increases, increased injury risk potentially could be a factor. And due to that impairment of function, you've got to factor in that perhaps falls could be uh, potentially increased. If that is the case, my recommendations to older adults to try and mitigate the risk of things like injury and potentially falls or risk of falls is to be aware and take those steps to try and reduce that risk. So awareness and education, you can then do the appropriate behaviours and actions post-workout to ensure that something catastrophic doesn't happen due to the impairment of physical function. Let's wrap this up then. The key message I want to communicate to older adults that may be watching this uh, video is that rest and recovery are very, very important. Um, I can't stress this enough. It's also, I think, important to schedule some lighter or more recovery fo focused sessions. So you shouldn't be doing high intensity activity on a day-to-day -day basis. That's just my opinion. I just think that, that we need to titrate and change and alter the intensities of uh, physical activity and exercise that we do to reap the greatest benefits in terms of the um, adaptations that can be made. So I implore you all to ensure you schedule rest into your training program to make sure you recover to monitor how you're feeling and use an intuitive approach where you're not trying to do things at a very high intensity um, on a continuous basis. So I'll leave you with that thought. Any comments, um, please post them in, in the comments below. If you're chasing the papers, let me know, send me a message. Um, so that'll, that's it. Bye for now, take care.